Hello everyone and welcome to this session on host performance booster. Before we move, let me introduce myself. I am Aleem Akhtar, working for Samsung Semiconductor India Bangalore. I am also one of the reviewer of Linux UFS subsystem. Let's have a look on today's agenda. So today's agenda looks like this. So we have divided this agenda into two half. The first part I am going to cover about the basics of UFS and its transaction. And that is important to understand HPB. And in the second part, my colleague Jem Young will cover what is HPB, why HPB, and he will also walk us through its implementation in Linux kernel. And then we will have a look on some of the performance improvement data with HPB. And at the end, uh, we will walk through the current mainline support status. Okay, so let's move forward. Technical background. As we all know, UFS stands for Universal Flash Storage. And this is a simple high performance mass storage device with a serial interface. And it's provide high performance and low power consumption. These days, these are widely used in commercial embedded product like a smartphone or any other embedded product which need a high performance storage device. Inside Linux, UFS implemented under a Kazi subsystem. Before we move forward, let's see where UFS stand in terms of read and write comparison with EMMC. So as you can see in this table, uh, with the EMMC 5.1, sequential read is around 250 megabytes per second, and write is around 125 megabytes per second. In case of UFS, the read is around 2100 megabytes per second, and sequential write is around 410 megabytes per second. So we can clearly see there is a 8.5x jump in read performance, and 3.5x jump in write performance. And no wonder why these days, all premium smartphones are coming with UFS as an internal storage. Let's move to next slide. So this is the top level architecture view of UFS. So UFS communication is a layered communication architecture and it is based on the SAM architecture model. So at the top of it, we have an application layer which contains UFS command sets. And UFS command sets contain UFS native command sets as well as simplified KASI command sets. And this layer also contains a task manager and a device manager. The next layer of UFS is UFS transport protocol layer or we call it UTP layer. So this layer is responsible for all the transaction in and out of UFS. And the last layer is UIC layer, we call interconnect layer, which consists of a MIPI Unipro protocol as well as MIPI M5 as a physical layer. To the next slide. This is the overall UFS system model. So you can see like it contains a host and a device and the host and device are connected over UIC layer and host run an application which talks to UFS driver, which is the protocol driver. And then it's talked to a low level controller driver. So low level controller driver is also called as HCI, like host controller interface, which basically expose register sets for the UFS protocol to communicate. So this is a view on how things are arranged in Linux. So within the kernel, we have a file system where like application make a request through a device file, and then it goes to block layer and then IO scheduler, and then it goes to Kazi layer. And from Kazi layer, it goes to UFS driver, and then through the low level driver, it's talked to UFS device. So if you see the overall code organization in the Linux, so driver Kazi UFS contains the entire code, including the protocol and the low level driver. So protocol driver is actually inside single file 
called uh, ufshcd.cnh and rest of the files are supported low level drivers. Move on to next. So now we understand uh, transaction in UFS. So as we talk like UFS is a layered protocol and it is based on Kazi SAM model. It is also a client server or a request response model where a host system act as a client and the target or the device act as a server. So host send the request and device or the target respond back to the request. And all UFS transactions consist of packets called UFS protocol information unit or UPIU. Right? So each UPIU contains a single constant 12 byte header a transaction specific segment, possibly one or more extended header segment and zero or more data segments. So this table lists all the UPIU that is supported in UFS. So you can see like we have a command UPIU, response UPIU, task management UPIU and task response UPIU and so forth and so forth, so on. So all these UPIU contains a single constant 12 byte header and the transaction code indicates what kind of a UPIU it is. Now let's understand how the flash storage work. So that is important to understand the read latency inside the UFS device. So all NAND flash devices use something called FTL or a flash translation layer to translate logical address of IO request to flash memory physical address, like logical to physical, or we called L2P mapping entries are managed by FTL, right? So this is similar to uh, CPU virtual address and the physical address where uh, MMU do the translation of a virtual address to physical address, similar to that, all logical IO request will ultimately get translated into a NAND flash physical address and this also have a translation entry or mapping entry that is generally stored on NAND flash memory. Now, normally all UFS devices have a small SRAM to cache this entry or the recently used entry to speed up the performance. But because of the high cost, the size of the SRAM is very limited. So we cannot cache all the mapping into SRAM. Right, so this is causing some latency in the read and in the next slide, we'll see what it is. So this is the overall concept where the lead read uh, latency is coming into, right? So let's take this example where the UFS device has fetch a read command from the host controller and then it requests for L2P entries but now since L2P entry is not cached into the SRAM, it has to go and load the entry from the NAND flash itself, which is going to add an extra latency. So which is depicted by TR map in this uh, right-hand side diagram, right? So we are going to address this read latency issue with a concept called host performance booster. And this concept is going to be covered by my colleague, Jomun, in the next part of the presentation. So with this, I'll hand over the presentation to Jomnyan. Okay, Alim. Thank you for sharing a good instruction about your past. So from now, I take a turn and I will introduce the host performance booster, also known as the HPP. Before start a section, please give me a time to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jamil. I work with Samsung since 2018 as a device driver engineer. And now I'm developing and maintaining the extended feature of UFS driver. I'd like to say thank you for sharing your time to this presentation. Okay, let's go back to the slide. The next section is the, is the introduction of HPP. To this section, we find out the overall concept of HPP, what is HPP, 
what does it do, how, and why should we know about the UFS and its architectural design to understand the concept of HP. So let's go to the first slide of this section. What is the HP? The host performance booster is an extension feature of UFS subsystem. The purpose of this feature is to improve the overall performance of UFS device through reducing the read latency. The HP is defined as an extension specification of JDAC UFS 3.1 standard. Its spec document can be found on JDAC website, so I added a link at the bottom of the slide so you can check it after the end of the presentation if you want no further. So now we know what the HPP stands for. Then let's talk about the concept. In the previous slide, we mentioned that the HP improves, improves the performance by reducing lead latency. How does the HPP reduce it? It works with simple idea. The HPP support caching the mapping. So the HPP supports caching the UFS device's mapping entries in host memory. The HPP operates on the host side. So in Kono, it can locate and access the host memory without any additional procedure like DMA or bounce buffer or something like that. Even in the embedded system, the host memory is still big space enough to cache the mapping entries of the UFS device. The total amount of the system's host memory continues to grow today. Also, accessing the random access memory is still quite faster than accessing the NAND flash memory of the UFS device. Of course, you can worry about the host memory usage, but are the mapping entries big enough to degrade overall performance of the system? Let me calculate the actual usage. So let's assume that the UFS logical storage space with a total capacity of 128 gigabyte. In general, the UFS, set, the UFS manages its internal storage space with four kilobyte logical block size. Therefore, there will be about 33 million blocks in the total space. It sounds a lot, but we should know that the HPP caches the mapping entries only. Through the specification, the HPP allows eight byte address information as a mapping entry for each logical block. So the total memory usage of mapping entries will be eight multiplied 33 million byte. So it will be a 256 megabyte. As a result, you can see the caching, all the mapping entries for the 128 gigabyte total storage will only use the 256 megabyte host memory space. And also the actual usage will be even lower because the HP doesn't cache the all mapping entries of storage on the host memory in normal use case. In this slide, you can see the brief call path of with command operation in UFS device and, and the lead latency when the HP is applied. As you check already, the UFS has an additional lead latency because of the NAND flash memory characteristics. If the mapping entry of the requested data is not cached in internal SLAM, the devices must, device must read the mapping entry from NAND memory first. But in this case, the THPB is included in the UFS driver and it operates. The HP check the host memory first when the read command is requested. If the required mapping entry is cached already, the HP transfers the mapping entry with the command to the device. Therefore, 
the device can access the pitch content cell of requested data directly. So at the right side, at the right side of the slide, you can see the differences of lead latency of PFS device between with and without HP. You can see the device can eliminate the additional lead latency of then access duplication with support of HTTP. So as a result, the total lead latency of device will be reduced. So now we understand the overall concept and overall behavior over concept and brief behavior of HTTP. So from this slide, I will explain a little bit more. I will explain the overall behavior, HTTP behavior in chronological order. On the left side of the slide, you can see the mapping entry, which is located in the host memory. The HTTP manages the logical space of GPS device by dividing them into specific size. This is called the HTTP region. Mapping entries within a region and region itself are logically contiguous. Then you can see the abstracted data structures of HTTP in the middle. The mapping entries for region number zero is already cached by HTTP, but the mapping entries for region number one is not. Also, you can see the state of region number, region number zero and region number one in the HTTP region lookup table. The state of region number one is valid, state of region number zero is valid, but the state of region number one is invalid in this state. So it is the initial start state of this slide. Let's assume that a new cache command is issued from the host the logical storage space, which is described by reason number one. The driver sends a command to the device as normal, and the device will return a response at the end of the transaction. In this case, the HPP doesn't do anything because there's a no mapping entries it is stored in the source memory for reason number one. Then the HPP request the first mapping entry of region number one to the device through the internal request issuing. When the issued request is arrived to the, when the issued request arrives at the device, the device passes the first mapping entry for the region number one to the driver as a request completion. Then the HPP stores the mapping entry in host memory. In this picture, you can see the, the mapping entry, which is highlighted with the blue color, is stored in the HP entry table for of the reason number one. And then the HP is operate, or, operated on the provision basis. As a result of that, the HPP sequentially request the all mapping entries in reason in the reason to the device. And when all mapping entries are cached in host memory, the reason state will in lookup table will be changed to valid. From now on, the HPP can support mapping entries in read command that request the data in the logical space storage. Logical storage space which is described by reason number one. Then the read command is requested the data which is stored in logical space, which is described by reason number one. When when the any of the read command is requested, the HP checks the validity of the reason. In this case, the reason for requested data is valid. It means that the every mapping table in the reason number one is ready to go. So the HP access and read the cache mapping date, cache mapping entries in host memory. Then the HP, the HP changes the request to lead command to the special command, 
it is the HPV with command, which contains the cache mapping entries inside the command configuration. Afterward, the HTTP finally issues that request finally issues the request which the command is changed to the HTTP read to the device. Mapping entries are passed along with this HTTP read command and it allows the device can access the NAND cell of requested data directly. Okay, so for, through the previous slide, we now understand the overall concept and overall behavior of HTTP. So from next session, we will take a step forward to a little bit more and a little bit deeper. It means that we will see the actual implementation of HTTP in Linux kernel. It contains the data structure, state model, and more detailed behavior with architectural specification of HTTP. So to understand the HTTP implementation, we should check the data structure first. As I explained already, the HTTP operates as a part of the UFS driver. So the UFS driver has the HTTP related device information as a part of in its internal data structure. It is stored in UFS HTTP device information data structure. It includes the number of logical units which the HTTP feature is activated with and the size of its region and subregion and the other information. This information is used to initialize the HTTP and allocate the cache space from the host memory. Another data structures of HTTP are defined in the HTTP code inside. Let's check the UFS HTTP LU first. It is the main data structure, which contains the data of the whole internal information of HTTP. Logical unit number, region table, which describes the whole region of HTTP, and HTTP state. Also, it has the, a, it has the LRU in for data structure either. It is used for cache management. You can see the UFS HTTP region and UFS, UFS HTTP subregion data structure. Each of it describes the region and subregion of the HTTP. Each region and subregion has its own state and index number of table. Each, each subregion has a UFS HTTP map context data structure. It describes the actual mapping entry of each subregion. All the mapping entries of the HTTP are stored in pre-allocated pre memory pages in UFS HTTP map context. Of course, there are still more internal data structures in HTTP, such as the UFS HTTP request data structure, which is used for internal command requests, but it is not in the scope of this presentation. So those are, those are not included in this picture. So for the for further information, please check the definitions in HP header file. So the next slide, you can see the internal state change of HP itself and its region and subregion through the whole life cycle. HP is initialized when the UFS driver is started and it enters the HP in HTTP init state. After, initial, after initialization is completed, it changes to HTTP present state. If the initial initialization process is fail or an unrecoverable problem so or an unrecoverable problem is occurs, the HTTP enters the HTTP failed state. It means that the HTTP will be deactivated. Even in this case, the UFS behavior itself is not affected. Then also, the 
depending on the host system's own reset signal or power management process. The HPP can go to the HP suspend or HP reset state after the end of those pro process and it will go back to the HP present state. So each of and every region and subregion of the HP has its own state. Immediately after at the HP HPP initialization, all non pin regions start in inactivate state. If the region is subsequently activated, the region will be in the HP region active state. And when it is deactivated again, it returns to the HP region inactivated state. Then the HP supports the special regions if it is needed. The pinned region. The pinned region does not change through the whole life cycle. This region is activated in and this region is activated in initialization process and it will never be deactivated. It means that the UFS logical unit space, which is described by those pinned reason, the mapping entries of it always cached in host memory. So those a reason is made up of several sub reason. When activating, the entire reason is activated in units of this sub reason. Our sub regions in our sub regions in an inactive region are in the unused state first. And then when a reason is when reason is activated, all subregions in this region changes to the invalid state first. And then while the mapping entry of the subregion is recasted to the device, the subregion of the mapping entry, the state is changes to HPB subregion issued state first. And then after, and then after the mapping entry is normally received to the device and it, it is stored in host memory, the status of it goes finally HP subregion valid. So the HPB check HP check the status, use, use those status to check the validity of the mapping entry when the, when the read command is requested. So HP decide to change requested read command to the HP read command, which include the mapping entry inside. When the HP state is, when the HP state is HP present, the region state is active or pinned, and also the subregion state is valid. And then the HP check the check the bitmap of the validity of map, of mapping entry itself. So the mapping entry itself should be clean. So then why is why is the the mapping entry could not be used even if those all state are valid i mean why some of those mapping entry becomes uh, dirty it is because of the write and discard command if those commands are requested to the user data which is mapping entry of it is already cached the hp directly set those mapping entries for those data as 30. So now we know the HP manages the mapping entries in cache. Then who decide to let the HP manages those caches and manages those mapping entries? The host, the host system or the user application or the 
HP itself? Actually, the device does it. Let's remember the let's remember about UFS itself. Alim gave us already uh, the good good explanations about data transactions of UFS specification. It operates as a server client model. It means that the each single transaction between host system and UFS device is a set of UPI packet, which include one command UPIU as a start and one response UPIU as the end of a transaction. The UFS device, which support the HP feature, gives an, gives an information for HP cache management to this response UPIU. The picture on the right side of this slide is the configuration of response UPIU in JDAC HP 2.0 specification. You can see the number of active subregion information and inactive region information is included in the end of this end of response UPIU. The HTTP is inactivated in unit of oh sorry. So you but the UFS device sends those HP cache management information in the response UPIU when the every single transaction is happened. And then the HP accepts those information and manages the mapping entries in the cache through this information. So you should check that the HP is, is inactivated in units of subreason but it is activated in units of sub, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the HP is inactivated in the units of reason, but is activated in the unit of sub reasons. So in this slide, we can see the how the HP activate the reason, which, is, which has the sub reason, which is informed by device. First, the normal I.O. is recasted from the user application. It goes all the way down through the file system, block layer, I.O. scheduler, scash layer, then finally reaches the UFS driver. In this layer, the HTTP can access the information of request inside. Then it checks the mapping entries for the request are cached. If the entries are not cached or the cached mapping entries are not valid, it decides to pass the request to device without any modification. Then the UFS device inform to activate the sub region through the, through the response UPIU. In this timing, the HPP is work as the uh, interrupt context. So it just add the informed sub region into act list and schedule the worker. The worker will start it at the process context later and it will request the read buffer command, the driver, to request the mapping entries of reason. After the completion of it, the HP stores the mapping entries in host memory and ready to request the HP read. The HPP sent the the HP sent the cache mapping entries as a part of HP read command. But if the transfer length of the request read command is bigger than 36 kilobyte, the whole mapping entries cannot be included in one HP read command. In this case, the HP sent the write buffer command as a prefetching command with the mapping data is needed, and then send the HP read command after. So in this picture, you can see the read buffer command and write buffer command. It's the first time to check the internal request of HPP. So the HPP uses a read buffer command as a reca to request a mapping entry to device and uses cache write buffer command to as a prefetching command internal but it is not, the, not in the scope of this presentation, the 
internal request issuing. So if you want to more information about it, please check the specification documentation of HPP 2.0 JDAC. And then you can see the additional risk management, the inactivate. In the normal use case of the HPP, the whole number of possible active regions is smaller than the total regions of our storage space. It means that the cache size is smaller than the total size of our mapping entries of the storage. In this case, some of some of activated reason can be inactivated at any time. There is two possible cases of region activation. The first case is when the new reason is new reason activation is formed by device, but the cache is already full. It means that there is no space remain for the activation. The HTTP manages all active region with RRU algorithm. To this scheme, the last reason on the list, which is the least recently used reason, will be selected as a victim. So the HPP removes the selected victim reason from the list and inactivated to make a free space. After that, it activates the new reason. In this case, the total number of active reason will not be changed. But the reason can be inactivated even there is an enough space in cache. This is the second case. The device can inform the exact reason which needs to be inactivated as a result of the device internal operation. Sometimes it could be a garbage collection and sometimes a defrag defragmentation or as a result of internal hard-coded FTL algorithm and else. So after the information arrival of the region inactivation, the HP find the informed reason of RRU list. And then it deletes the reason directly from the list and inactivate it. In this case, the total number of active reasons will not be reduced and will be reduced. Okay, so through the previous section, now we understand the detailed behavior of HP and each implementation. But there's, there's a still another question. Is it really works well and the performance is improved as intended with HPP? So we will show the measured performance improvement through this section. So in this section, the, the quantitative performance result of UFS device and HP applied device are shown through the graph and table. Through this comparison, we can confirm the actual effect of HP and overall improvement on read command. So in this slide, you can see the benchmark and user experience result comparison. Let's go to let's go to the picture on the left side. In this benchmark result, you can see the change of throughput of US UFS device with and without HPP. In the in the one gigabyte IO range result, there's no big difference between two results. It means that the almost every mapping entries of read command occurred is cached in internal device as RAM and hit rate of it is quite good enough in small IO range. But as the IO range increases, the performance of UFS becomes decreases. It means that the cache miss is happened more in bigger IO range environment. But with the HP, you can see that increasing the IO range does not decrease the performance of UFS device. It means that the more mapping entries are cached in host memory with, a, with HP, so cache miss isn't, isn't happened a lot even with large IO range. So 
Then let's go to next table. It shows the changes of lab lunch. It shows the changes of lab lunch at lunch time as each cycle increases. A cycle means the amount of time usage which is spent to launch the set of predefined applications sequentially. The difference in the time required between, two, between those two cases increases as the cycle increases. This means that, that the longer the storage devices uses, the greater the performance gain through the, through the usage of HP. So, in next slide, include the more detailed chunk range measurement result. So this graph shows the performance cha performance change of UFS device with and without HP, according to the chunk size of the read pattern. The performance improvement is most, most noticeable in small chunk, and the performance improvement gradually decreases as the chunk increases. But you can still see that the HPV improves the imp HPV improves the read performance compared to conventional in all size of chunk. So through this benchmark user experience and chunk range result, we can confirm that HPV is effect effect HPV in actually improved the read command, actually improved the performance by reducing the read command and it works well. Now we, now we understand the HV in general and we have also confirmed that this idea actually works well. Me, Alim and my, uh, my other colleagues who actually developed the current HV thought this idea was quite reasonable and decided to open this code implementation and overall idea as open source. So in this chapter, I want to share what has happened and what is going on with HPP. So let's talk about the status of HP upstream on this mainline first. The HP upstream has been started in second quarter 2020. And now the patch version 40, which support the HP 2.3 specification is committed to the current sky software by Dejan Park, works with Samsung, and the host control mode for H and the host control mode for HP or is also proposed by every element WDC. So below is the list of the people who contribute to the create the create the current mainline HP code. And also there's a lot of people which is not enlisted and they are still review. They, they are still help and support the HP through review, recommend, or suggestions, and lots of lots of their effort they can do. I'd like to say thank you for your ideas, suggestions, tests, and patches. Thank you. So next slide, you can see the timeline of important events that occurred during the HP upstream process. So left side, on the, on the 18th of March, 2020, the Micron posted the first HP code, which follows the HP 1.0 specification on the mail line. This is the first, this is the first event that happened with the HP on mail line. And then after, after the more than one year, so finally the HP merged in merged as a AOSP Android open source project, and also is it is committed as a Linux Sky Linux Sky subgroup. So I'd like to I I don't want to list every band on the timeline in Word. So if you want if you want to know more detailed history. Please check patches and commands on Linux Sky Subtree. So, this is the last slide. Through this presentation, we saw the overall operation and implementation and ideas of HP. And also, we saw the process of being 
incorporated into the open source open source project and open source itself and current status. PHP is like all other open source code is constantly changing. From still now, PHP, which was first posted last year, has now been patched up to version 40. It means that HP is still alive. So there has been many, many suggestions with HP, which are included in the current HP, HP mainline code. So please contribute it. It is the main purpose of this presentation. We decided to introduce, introduce the HPP to the people who is a part of open source community to encourage the people to participate in. Please review it, test it, share the bug and fixes you found. We will appreciate for your joining. Thank you. Ah, if you have any question, feel free to ask Feel free to ask them in Q&A session after this presentation. Me and Arlene will do our best to answer all your questions as, as we can, if, if we have enough time. Thank you.